My name is Graham Steele. I am the CEO and founder of CryptoSense. CryptoSense software allows our users to discover cryptography in their infrastructure and applications, to analyze it for vulnerabilities and fix it, integrating that into their development process, and to transform their cryptography for migration to the cloud or for post-quantum crypto. So in our webinar today, I'd encourage you all to use the chat feature to ask questions. We're aiming to do about 20 minutes uh, going through our material on crypto risk, and then we'll answer some questions at the end. Uh, so the subject today is the impact of crypto failures. The idea is that we're going to look at some real life examples and look at what kind of damage or, or consequences were for these uh, crypto failures, how the breach happened, uh, how that could be avoided in, in future. So it's pretty well known now that cryptography is easy to get wrong. Uh, it's a technology which is hard to use. There are not that many expert cryptographers around, and most developers struggle already with basic security technologies, uh, let alone uh, cryptography. Uh, so this is a sort of well-known folklore, but what actually goes wrong in practice with uh, the kind of modern cryptography APIs that are available today? And when this cryptography goes wrong, what are the consequences? What actually happens to the businesses that are affected? So the way we're going to do it today is we're going to look through a number of specific uh, crypto risks. Uh, and we're going to look for each of those risks. We're going to give a concrete example of, of where this uh, problem occurred. Uh, so we'll evaluate the sort of nature of the risk uh, and then and also give a concrete example. And this will be uh, part one of our crypto failures uh, webinar series. We'll be doing another one uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, part two, during which we'll talk a little bit more about how to detect and control and prevent these failures in an organization. So the first risk uh, I want to talk about this morning is key management. So when people talk about cryptography, they often think about algorithms and, and clever research around cryptographic algorithms. But in reality, what goes wrong in practice that we see here at CryptoSense is, is more often than not the key management. Uh, so, so key management we understand as being everything associated with the full life cycle of a key. So that could be the key's creation, the way it's generated, could be being sure that we've destroyed it and made it unavailable. We have to make sure we distribute it to the right people so they can use this key material for their cryptographic operations. We need to store it the right way so that if ever a attacker arrives in my infrastructure, that attacker is not able to get hold of the key material. We need to make sure it's used only for the right things. So using keys for incorrect operations can cause security issues. We may need to keep backups. We need to restore the backups. We may need to do rollover and refresh after a certain period. So you can see there's a lot of associated difficulty and, and management process that needs to go in around keys to, to make them usable in, in cryptography. And we have this nice quote here from, from Bruce Schneier uh, from his uh, Applied Cryptography book. Key management is the hardest part of cryptography and often the Achilles heel of an otherwise secure system. And this is definitely the case in the experience of CryptoSense um, dealing with systems out there in the real world. It's interesting that at cryptography conferences, typically you see a lot of academic work on algorithms and new crypto systems and protocols, but very little work around how to do key management uh, properly. And it tends to be solved as an individual problem by individual organizations in their, in their own uh, way. And that's definitely consistent with our experience here at CryptoSense looking at our uh, customer systems we see errors happening much more often inside key management than in algorithms or, or other sort of more technical or mathematical aspects of cryptography. So our first case study is associated with Uber, the peer-to-peer -peer riding company. So in October 2016, they had a issue when one of the developers checked uh, some code into the uh, into a GitHub repository that was publicly uh, available uh, that accessed uh, production systems at Uber. So that's already a breach of their policy. They didn't want to put that code uh, publicly. Uh, but it wouldn't have been a problem if the code had been available, if it hadn't had access to the real production data. The problem was that in the code was a hard-coded credential for getting access to some of, of Uber's data. So a little cryptographic credential that's used in a, an HMAC challenge, so a little sort of challenge response protocol to get access to, to some data. Uh, and attackers found this code on GitHub. They used the hard-coded credential that was in the code to access uh, driver records. They actually managed to get 50,000 uh, driver records. And essentially, they held Uber to ransom. They asked for $100,000 to destroy the data and, and not release it. 
So Uber decided to pay the ransom. Um, but the problem is that allowing 50,000 driver records to leak is something which can give rise to a large fine under things like GDPR. In this case, it was actually a state fine in the US that was uh, levied. Uh, and so Uber was fined $200 million two years later in September 2018 uh, for this breach of, of personal data, uh, since a lot of this driver information was indeed personal uh, data. So that's a, an idea of the kind of consequences. $200 million is a, is a significant uh, cash hole. Uh, and this problem of hard-coded keys, in fact, is one of the most common ones that we see uh, with cryptography. Uh, there was... Uh, in 2018, a, uh, a remote code execution problem in a very widely used uh, web server framework called Oracle WebLogic that was due to a hard-coded key inside a particular library called PrimeFaces that the Oracle WebLogic uh, used. Uh, and that's typical of the kind of things that we see. There were 124 hard-coded key-related CVEs uh, in 2018, in fact. So hard-coded credentials and keys are indeed one of the, the big issues that we see in, in key management and, and a real risk uh, for of serious uh, issues in cryptography. So the second kind of risk is around random number generation. So most people know that random number generation is vital for cryptography. So we use random numbers to generate keys. The keys have to be random, of course, if we don't want the attacker to be able to guess them. But they're also used elsewhere in various cryptographic operations around blinding to avoid side channel attacks, sort values on passwords, challenges and challenge response protocols, initialization vectors for modes that need them, uh, for padding where we need to use random padding. Uh, this is a, a nice quote here by um, an author from uh, a paper about random number generation that came out at the end of the ninth, ninth, uh, 1970s. Uh, it's actually the name of the paper. So the name of the paper is random number generation is, is too important to be left to chance. And, and that is indeed the case when we're using cryptography. So let's look at an example of a random number generation failure. So most people have heard of the Equifax uh, breach that happened in, in 2017, so one of the largest breaches of, of recent times. So the breach wasn't caused by a random gen number generation failure, but uh, as part of the process after the Equifax breach, uh, Equifax encouraged their customers to lock uh, credit reports. So that is to make sure that they couldn't uh, lose um, credit score because their personal data from the Equifax breach was being used to, to make fraudulent applications. Part of that involved Equifax generating a PIN for their customers for unlock, so uh, a specific code that their, their customers could use to unlock those credit reports when they were sure that they had taken whatever steps they needed to be sure that, that they weren't being breached or, or defrauded. But the PIN uh, that was supposed to be random wasn't securely generated. And once you'd seen your own PIN, uh, it was essentially fairly easy to work out what somebody else's PIN would be with if you had some idea when they locked their credit report. So it was basically generated directly from a timestamp. Uh, and so given that everybody was locking their credit reports in a very short period, an attacker who'd got hold of the Equifax personal data and was trying to break in to, to, to use someone's data could just unlock their credit report um, by figuring out the PIN by brute force from a, from a rough timestamp window. Uh, so what were the consequences of this? Well, Equifax were already in a, a lot of trouble, of course, by this point, because they'd lost millions of records of, of personal data. Um, but this kind of botched response uh, didn't help the, the, the executives who were trying to save their skin, a number of which uh, were, were gotten rid of in, the, in this period shortly afterwards. This kind of random number generation fail we see elsewhere. So uh, another example is RSA keys that can be factored. So normally RSA keys are supposed to be the product of two large primes, so very hard for a computer to factor. Um, but in fact, if two RSA keys share a prime number, they can be easily factored. And we've seen examples of this recently in the IoT world where random number generation fails and, and the keys can be broken. Uh, random number generation related backdoors in elliptic curve random number generators were also a big topic uh, after the Snowden revelations, uh, that there are genuinely systematic failures of, of random number generation that cause all sorts of problems in, inside cryptography. So let's look at one more risk, the interaction between uh, cryptographic operations. So this is a phenomenon that we see often in the kind of cryptographic material that we get to review at CryptoSense. Typically, the situation will be that 
that one cryptographic operation uh, is, is secure and a second operation is secure. But if ever the same system executes one operation and then executes the second operation, then there is a complete loss of security. So typically the, the system is allowed to execute operation A and allowed to op operate, uh, execute operation B, and it's the attacker who's going to come along and do the one after the other. And the security review is only ever considered the two operations in isolation and considered like, well, if the attacker does that, then there's no problem. Uh, or well, if the attacker does B, then there's no problem either. But the problem is that if they do A and B, then, then we have a problem. And, and we see this a lot in, in cryptography. So let's look at a concrete example of the risk posed by the interaction between crypto operations. So this breach is related to a bank, it's related to Capital One, uh, and it happened in July uh, 2019. So Capital One is a big user of the Amazon Web Services public cloud service. They migrated a lot of key applications to that service. Uh, and most of you will probably have heard of the AWS S3 service. So it's one of the first services that AWS supplied in their public cloud, allows you to store uh, potentially very large amounts of data in, in the public cloud uh, via a simple API. So if you're going to store sensitive data in these, uh, what they're called buckets, so S3 storage areas, typically you'll decide to, to encrypt them just in case somebody can get access. Um, but as well as encrypting them, you can also make it the case that the, the bucket is not public. So you actually have to give a credential uh, in order to get access to that bucket. It's not just open to the outside world. Uh, and typically you're going to do both of these things. So what happened was a disgruntled ex-Amazon uh, employee decided to, uh, for various reasons, to, to get involved in, in, in hacking some critical installations. Uh, and she used a technique known as a server-side request forgery to get hold of the credentials for access to a bucket. So server-side request forgery essentially means that you are talking to, let's say, a web server via your browser, and you do some kind of unanticipated or, or unexpected behavior. That means that the server makes a request to its backend database or backend data storage that it wasn't uh, supposed to do. So, so you've forged that request. You've, you've forced the server to make a request. So it's interesting to make the server make the request rather than trying to make the request to the database yourself because the server already has the access credentials. So the, the server is expecting to talk to its database. And so the database is expected to, to execute the query as it gets. So instead of trying to get access to the database yourself, you just persuade the, data, the server to, to make the, the access for you. So that's indeed what this uh, hacker was able to do. And, and this request, uh, this vulnerability category, server side request forgery, is more and more common and, and more and more useful in, in cloud type uh, attacks. So we've persuaded the server to make a request, and this request gave up some credentials for accessing uh, some AWS S3 buckets. Uh, so then the attacker used the credentials to get access to the bucket and retrieve the data, which in this case was a lot of personal records of people who'd applied for credit cards with, with Capital One. Uh, so she was able to get this data, but uh, the data was indeed uh, encrypted following uh, Capital One's policy of in encrypting the data that they put in AWS S3. The problem was that the way that encryption was applied, the attacker didn't need to get hold of some separate key or separate credential to decrypt uh, that data. She could actually request to the AWS uh, key management service to do that decryption for her. So essentially, it, it seems that the same credential that was used to access the bucket was used to access the decryption service, so the, the AWS KMS that does the decryption of the data that's in an AWS S3 bucket. So this was a sort of failure of, of one operation. So the first operation to access the bucket, is, it was fine because the, the even if that was compromised, the, the data was um, encrypted. And the second operation to access the KMS was also fine because we imagined that the, the attacker wouldn't have managed to get hold of the encrypted data. But in fact, the attacker was able to do both using the same credential. Uh, and that was the sort of failure. Uh, it created a single point of failure that the, the attacker was able to exploit to get hold of the data. So what were the consequences of this? So the attacker was able to obtain uh, just over 100 million uh, personal records. Uh, and in fact, there's no evidence that she used these personal records for any kind of fraud. Um, however, uh, even without that data being exploited, Capital One booked a minimum $150 million charge 
for uh, credit insurance and, and anti-fraud insurance that they would have to issue to all of these people who'd applied to them. Uh, and just the basic cleanup and, and forensic work they were going to have to do to, to fix the breach. So this was the, the kind of cost you can get from this sort of breach, even if the data is not really used. Uh, so quite a significant uh, charge. And we've seen quite a lot of these examples of, of mixing together of operations, uh, producing a, a, an attack, even when a single operation wouldn't. Another uh, well-known example, because it actually went to court and a lot of the details uh, came out, uh, was the RBS WorldPay fraud against the cash machine network uh, back in 2008, where attackers were able to use two seemingly safe commands of a hardware security module uh, together to decrypt pin blocks and uh, get hold of pin codes for, for fake cards. Okay, let's take a look at our uh, last risk uh, for today's material. Uh, and this is probably the most well-known risk in cryptography, um, but equally it's the one that in, in terms of number, at least, leads to the fewest failures, at least that we see at CryptoSense. So those other risks around key management, uh, mixing up operations or getting random number generation wrong are, are things that we see uh, much more often. Uh, but nonetheless, weak algorithms can indeed be a, a, the source of real uh, attacks. Uh, they're state of the art in algorithms is always changing. So in fact, uh, a real challenge for organizations these days is to become what's known as being crypto agile. So able to change algorithms when the state of the art changes and not have to completely rip up infrastructure and applications to try and find those algorithms and, and fix them. One of the reasons why this is challenging is because those weak algorithms are often hidden inside libraries and application frameworks. So in our own code, in our own business logic code, we probably don't mention cryptographic algorithms that often. But by calling a library to access a database or contact a single sign-on server or talk to another computer over the network, we're actually calling a library which will itself be making a choice of algorithms. And that choice might be hard to fix from configuration files that are de buried deep in the file system. Uh, so this is why weak algorithms tend to still be found inside applications, even sometimes years after they've been deprecated and, and considered no longer secure for, for state-of-the-art applications. Let's look at a concrete uh, use of an attack against a, a weak uh, algorithm. So this is in a piece of malware that was uh, nicknamed Flame. Uh, that was first discovered in May 2012, but had probably been deployed some time before that. It's very hard to tell from forensics. So this is one of those very advanced malwares that was discovered deep embedded in systems uh, all over the world. So what actually happened was uh, a state-level intelligence service decided to uh, carry out an attack on the Iranian nuclear program. So this was carried out by a specific piece of malware called Stuxnet. Uh, that, but the preceding uh, piece of malware that was used to discover the Iranian infrastructure and work out how that Stuxnet attack was going to work, uh, the information was extracted from a piece of reconnaissance malware uh, that was uh, nicknamed Flame. So how did Flame get itself uh, installed? So we know that when we update our computers, they have to be the updates that we receive have to be signed. They have to be signed by an authority that is allowed to update uh, the machines. And the Flame malware managed to get itself installed uh, on Windows machines uh, by using uh, a fake certificate that it produced by uh, an MD5 hash function collision. So what does that mean? So that means that the weak hash function MD5 was exploited to create a certificate that would pass a higher level uh, in the certificate chain certificate and, and be certified as OK for, for signing um, updates to the code. Um, the way that this MD5 hash function collision was uh, produced was by... Uh, so MD5 is now known to be broken and, and the collision method is public. Uh, but research by uh, Mark Stevens, so the guy who discovered uh, the MD5 collisions and, and published um, papers about it, uh, he later did some forensic work on the particular MD5 collision method used in Flame and showed that it was different from the one which became publicly known. So essentially we can conclude that the state level actors involved in this attack already had their own techniques for MD5 collision before this was known publicly that this was, this was possible to do. So it's a really concrete example of what we sort of know from folklore, which is that if we see an algorithm is getting weak, probably state level agencies already have ways to, to break it. 
so what were the consequences of this uh, collision and, and malware installation? Well, essentially, it led to the success of the Stuxnet operation, which destroyed up to a thousand uh, nuclear centrifuges, essentially by stopping them and starting them and spinning them too fast and so on until they destroyed themselves. We also see uh, still uses of the single DES uh, encryption uh, algorithm. So most people know that this should, this should be phased out. It's just uh, the key is basically just too short. It can be brute forced by computing on, on cloud computing networks without a, a great deal of money. Uh, and SHA-1 certificates. So in 2016, browser manufacturers started refusing to accept SHA-1 certificates. And in, in the last few years, we've seen increasingly sophisticated attacks. So the kind of attack that allows you to create a fake certificate, uh, so a chosen prefix collision is known technically, is now possible on SHA-1 with a reasonable expenditure. Uh, so SHA-1 is also uh, something we need to root out and, and get out of our systems to, to stay secure. So in summary, crypto vulnerabilities are more common than we think. So they're more common, in fact, than cross-site scripting or SQL injection attacks. Uh, there's an interesting paper by uh, Jonathan Katz that was at IEEE uh, Secure Development Conference in 2016, where he gives some, a very interesting summary of, of a survey of results about how common crypto flaws are uh, and how uh, they can be avoided in practice. Uh, one of the figures he cites is from another review by a scientist at MIT, where they took a whole bunch of uh, recent CVEs and tried to figure out what kind of crypto failure they were. And interestingly, 83% of them are found in the way that applications use cryptography, not in the code in the library. So they're about the way that the application calls its crypto library, right? So that they're not bugs in, in crypto libraries like the famous um, heartbeat bug or, or things like this. So it's really in the way that our application is calling the library that we need to look for our crypto issues. Uh, and so this is exactly what our tool here at CryptoSense does. So CryptoSense analyzes a platform currently the only tool that gives you full visibility on the way that your application is using cryptography, not just in the business logic, but in the third party libraries, framework components, and so on, and, and gives you automated state of the art vulnerability analysis on that. And I'd be very happy to hear from you to, to explain a little bit more about that and demo that just, uh, you can have a look at the, the URL on the, on the slide there. So that concludes uh, part one of our crypto failures uh, webinar series. So we've spun through a few of the risks. Uh, there are more, of course, but we've given a flavor of the kind of business risks that we're running um, if we're not managing our cryptography carefully and at scale across all of the applications and, and infrastructure we're using. So we're looking at some quite substantial breach costs there in the hundreds of millions in, in some of those cases. So I'd be delighted to uh, take some questions. Let's just have a look here. Um, okay. All right. So, we, yeah, we've had some, um, some questions uh, come in. Uh, so the first question is, uh, why, do, uh, why do crypto failures happen since cryptography is now standard technology? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, well, so one reason is that most developers um, are not cryptography experts. So it's in fact, even cryptographers, even experts in cryptography get cryptography wrong typically on their first try. Um, it's just a very complex technology to, to, to use and to get right. Uh, and most developers haven't had that training, so they're very likely to, to get it wrong in their first go. The other thing is it's quite hard to test. So um, developers who are used to writing functional tests might uh, be able to check that data gets uh, encrypted and then decrypted and you get the same data back, for example. But that won't test whether the encryption was actually secure, whether we were keeping the key secure and whether it couldn't be uh, attacked by an attacker. So, so we can easily get the impression that things are working when they're not. So I'd say that's probably the main reasons why um, cryptography failures still happen. So the second question is, what's the best way to train developers to avoid crypto failures? Uh, it's another good question. So there are some very good training courses available these days on cryptography and cryptography flaws. Uh, for example, at Black Hat, you can see some good courses in, in ways that crypto goes wrong and how to, to exploit those failures. Uh, but it's actually tough to train uh, uh, cryptographers. Typic the typical training to be, a, to be a cryptographer is sort of a PhD, so, so sort of three years. Uh, and in general, we can't train all of our developers to become crypto experts. So what we really need is a process that allows uh, scalable review which is what something like Crypto Sense Analyzer can do. So and, uh, enable the core of crypto trained or security trained personnel in the organization to at scale quickly review and, and manage the cryptography policy across all of the applications. 
Uh, finally, we've just got time for one more question. So uh, the question is, can I avoid crypto issues by using a better crypto uh, API? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, which we which we get quite a lot. So uh, definitely some APIs are easier to use than others. So so old legacy APIs, I'm thinking of things like OpenSSL, tend to be quite tricky to use securely, uh, or tricky to use at all, in fact. Uh, whereas other APIs are a little bit more uh, mistake-proof. So they, they uh, there's actually been some interesting research on that recently, um, looking into which APIs are easier to use than, than others. Um, but generally what we see is if you make too many choices, if you make the API too restrictive, uh, and what it's allowed to do to try and avoid mistakes. Uh, developers then have another need and then they have to um, go around those restrictions of the API and, and then they have to use some other API or, or put in some crypto themselves and then you, you, they will then make a mistake. Um, then they, but they need to do that to get their work done so they sort of have no choice. So, so it is quite tricky to come up with an API um, that's uh, restrictive uh, but also allows developers to do everything they need to do. Uh, one goal can be just to use an API that makes it easy to review. Um, so at least make it clear when the API is used, what it's being used for, and, and make it easy to, to, to do that review uh, later. Uh, okay, so that's all we've got time for for um, uh, the questions uh, today. If you didn't get your question answered, uh, we'll follow up with you afterwards. So don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll be in touch to, to help you uh, get a, an answer to your question. Uh, and if you're watching this through on the on-demand uh, playback and you have a question, uh, please send it into webinars at uh, cryptosense.com and uh, one of our team will follow up with you uh, and we'll try and get your, your question answered there. Uh, so if you've been attending live, we'll also be sending you a recording of this webinar in the next few days. And thanks, I do appreciate your time with us. Uh, and I hope you have an enjoyable rest of the day. Thank you very much.